everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Corey Dayharsh, and I'm joined with Chris Larson to bring you our topic for this webinar of how to invest into storage units, car washes, and other private placement style investments through a retirement account. Uh, your presenters today are first myself, Corey Dayharsh with Advanta IRA. I've been with the company for about seven. This is my eighth year uh, in the self-directed industry and with Advanta IRA. I served a number of years as a client account manager handling day-to-day -day transactions for our clients. I've also worked in the accounting department, but my role currently is in business development where I network and educate people on the benefits and uses of self-directed retirement account for the overall betterment of your retirement income and diversifying your portfolio. My guest today is Chris Larson. He is the founder and principal at Next Level Income, which is a great uh, investment tool that you can utilize. He is also the host of the Next Level Income Show, which is a podcast you can check out anywhere you find your podcast and listen to them. Uh, Chris is also in my local area of Asheville, North Carolina. I know he spent some time before joining the investment space in the medical device sales uh, world. So he's got a lot of expertise and a lot of education that he's here to bring us. I really appreciate him joining me today. And I know he'll jump into his own background and, and expertise a little bit further at his portion of the presentation. But Chris, thank you very much for joining us today. Corey, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having, giving me the opportunity. Of course, of course. Uh, just so everyone is aware of what our agenda is going to be today, I'm going to cover the basics of self-directed retirement account investing, how easy it is to get an account set up and funded, and how there's no tax consequence or other types of things that you may be thinking about when you're talking about transitioning from your current retirement style accounts to a self-directed account. I'm going to briefly cover the investment strategies we're talking about today with a real quick case study of one of these types of investments. And then I'm going to turn over to Chris, who's going to cover his side and his specific presentation on investing in private equity uh, with examples of real estate, car washes, and a few different things. I do want to let the audience know you will be muted for the duration of today's webinar, but we do encourage active participation. If you go ahead and use the question box in your GoToWebinar panel, I'll be reading those and I'll be addressing the questions as we go. As long as it relates to the presentation, uh, we'll bring those up. We also have a slide at the end where we're just going to answer any questions that aren't necessar necessarily related as we're presenting so we don't get off track too far. Uh, one other thing I want to mention, is that the recording of this webinar will be emailed to everyone that signs up. If you want to share it with a friend or someone that you think will benefit from it, it will go live on Advanta's YouTube page within about 24 hours. And I'm also going to upload a PDF copy of today's slide deck to the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel. So you could download that if you're interested as well. So just a brief explanation of Advanta IRA and the self-directed retirement industry. We are a self-directed IRA administrator that has been in business for 21 years now. We've got just over 10,000 active clients with just under 3 billion in assets under management. We expect to cross that 3 billion threshold by the end of this calendar year. Uh, all of our clients funds that are not actively invested are secured and insured up to FDIC limits in trust bank accounts. So all of your money that you don't have invested is safe and secure. Once you make an investment, obviously, that is at your discretion. And obviously, you would have done the due diligence to be comfortable with the investments you make. And as I mentioned earlier with one of my previous roles, we pair each client we have with a dedicated client account manager. So you have a one-to-one -one relationship and a go-to person. If you have questions or concerns about your account, the rules relating to your account, or when you're ready to get a transaction done. We're there to help you make that as smooth and simple of a process as possible. A lot of times with the style of investments we're talking about today, we can get a transaction done within one to two business days of you sending us the paperwork for the deal you're trying to participate in. Now, if you've never heard about self-direction or this is brand new to you, that's very common. Only about 4% of US-based retirement accounts are currently being self-directed. And in the grand scheme of things, that industry, the US-based retirement industry, has about $40 trillion in it. So when you put that into perspective, only about $1.5 trillion or so is actively being self-directed. That's really only because people don't know that this opportunity exists for them. When you're with a fiduciary custodian or a financial advisor, they have a vested interest in you thinking this is too risky or too scary and they'd rather have you keep your money with them where they're charging you either a rate or a percentage of the earnings that you're generating uh, to 
point you in the direction of specific investments that are usually publicly traded stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. But you can actually hold a vast array of different style investments with your retirement funds, which is what Advanta IRA as an alternative asset administ administrator specializes. Uh, there's a number of different types of plans that can be self-directed. Most people are familiar with a simple traditional or Roth IRA, or maybe have a 401k, as an employer-sponsored plan. If you're a small business owner or self-employed, there are other types of IRAs, like a SEP IRA or a simple IRA that you could utilize that have higher contribution limits than traditional and Roth IRAs. If you're self-employed and have no W-2 wage earners, you can have an individual 401k plan. And also, if you're interested in someone that maybe has a high deductible health policy or have a young one in your life that you'd like to set aside and invest money that they can use for educational expenses, we do offer health savings accounts and education savings accounts that can be self-directed. If you're interested in any of these plan types or learning more, you can reach out to me directly and I'll be very happy to give you some education and information and point you in the direction of the plan type that's going to fit your needs best. So I alluded to this earlier on the agenda. It's really simple to get these funds uh, moved over into a self-directed account. In 99% of cases, there is no tax consequence. The only case that there is a tax consequence is when you choose to do that by switching an account from a tax deferred or traditional style account over to a Roth account, meaning you're paying the taxes on it now so that the funds can grow completely tax-free moving forward and into the future. So the two key ways people fund accounts are by a custodian to custodian transfer, meaning I have an IRA somewhere and I wanna move it to a self-directed IRA. That's very simple. You complete a transfer request form for the company you want to receive the funds. They send it to the company currently holding the funds and it basically moves your money from one back office to the other so that you can start self-directing. That is not a reportable or a taxable event. It's just back office to back office, one IRA to the same type of IRA with another company. The other way people fund these accounts commonly is known as a rollover. Most times a direct rollover specifically, meaning you have an employer sponsored plan, whether you're eligible for what's called an in-service rollover, if you're still with that employer, or as soon as you terminate employment, everyone is eligible for a rollover. You just initiate a distribution out of the employer sponsored plan and you roll those funds over into another qualified plan. When you're doing this, it does generate some tax reporting for good measure. I do wanna explain very simply, the distributions reported to the IRS on form 1099-R and the rollover into the new qualified plan is reported on form 5498. Just like a seesaw, as long as those two figures on 1099-R and 5498 level out, that means you're not taking any for personal use, you're moving everything over to the new plan. There is no tax consequence, it's a complete wash. You're allowed to do that pretty much as much as you want to, unless you're doing an indirect rollover where you take personal possession of the money for up to 60 days. In that case, you just need to make sure that you roll over as much, if not all of the funds into a qualified plan by the 60 day mark. And then you do not have a tax consequence for all of the money that was rolled over. Uh, one more time, the only case that you're having a tax consequence is if in this process, you're choosing to do a Roth conversion, which would be your own tax strategy you'd wanna speak with your advisor for. I also want to break down that contributions are unlimited. I'm sorry, <laughs> contributions are limited based off of an annual uh, total that you're allowed to contribute of your earned income, but your earnings are unlimited. So your earnings do not go against your contribution limits. If you make an investment and it generates way more than your annual contribution limit, a lot of clients come to us and say, oh, I, I exceeded my limit. That is not the same as your new contribution into the plan. That is just earnings you've generated by your investment. And we're hoping that is as high as possible for you. The basic rules for self-directed investing are pretty simple. As long as you're not investing into a life insurance policy or a hard to value collectible like antiques or fine wine or artwork, you can pretty much hold anything you'd like to within a retirement account. The only other way that the IRS restricts these is by labeling certain individuals relative to you as disqualified persons. I'll cover those more specifically on the next slide. And real quickly as well, there are certain types of taxes that may come into play when you're making investments with a self-direct account. Those really come into play when the income you're generating, which is supposed to be passive, is not necessarily passive. You're drawing into a little bit of active income potentially, or the investment is utilizing debt financing where unrelated debt finance income may come into play. 
with those scenarios, we have some resources and education we can provide you. The investment providers you're working with are usually very well versed in this and have strategies to help mitigate those things as well. Uh, that in itself is kind of a different topic for a different webinar that we cover. If you're interested in it, you can reach out to me and I'll point you in the direction of that information. So disqualified persons, it's very simple. If you think about a family tree, anyone up and down the main trunk of the tree. So your parents, your grandparents, as old as are still alive, your children, your grandchildren, as young as you're able to see during your lifespan, yourself and your spouse. Those are the disqualified persons. And that's not to say you can't join and partner with those. That's to say you cannot sit on the other side of a table for a deal with them. So I can't buy a piece of property that my father currently owns. I can't invest into a syndication that my grandfather is a general partner of as a limited partner with my retirement account. So that's basically the only rules prohibiting or restricting how you utilize your retirement funds. Again, you may not have known any of this because you're more familiar with the publicly traded sector, but these are all things you can do and have always pretty much been allowed to do with your retirement account. So today's asset classes that we're talking about are private equity assets. For the most part, they're held in two different categories or classes. The first one being private stock. So as long as the stock is not currently publicly traded, you can hold it in a self-directed account. Some examples are private bank stock. If you know a local bank that's trying to get started in your area or local businesses like car washes, which we'll go over today, self-storage, which we'll cover today, laundromats, restaurants. I've seen clients invest into breweries and coffee shops. Anything that you can own a private share of ownership in is something you can hold with your retirement account through a private stock investment. And the other opportunity for private equity is syndications, where you're investing as a limited partner into a deal where a group typically called a general partnership team, has done all of the research, all of the due diligence for the most part, and has an action plan as to how to generate money and generate profit for both the general partnership team and the limited partnership team that are basically putting their money up and trusting the outline of the deal that you receive in like what's called a private placement memorandum or a prospectus. So a lot of times with syndications, we see multifamily properties, whether it's an apartment, a hotel, different types of asset classes in that range or commercial de development or commercial items like office buildings self-storage car washes laundromats kind of the same thing just structured a little bit differently in the case of a syndication just a brief disclaimer before i get into my quick case study uh, myself and advanta ira and its employees do not provide any investment advice or endorse any specific products or opportunities you may hear about all of the information I'm here to share with you is for educational purposes. We always encourage our clients to consult their own attorneys, CPAs, financial advisors for the due diligence process before they transact into an investment. So I've got a real quick case study uh, on how to invest into a self-storage syndication. In this case, I've got a gentleman named Jacob who's got funds in a managed re retirement account. He connects with investor Jane, who's put together a private offering to purchase and upgrade a local self-storage facility in their community. Denise provides Jacob all the subscription paperwork and the prospectus on the deal, how that general partnership team that Denise is part of plans to purchase, improve, and then potentially sell the property for a profit. Once he reviews it all and decides it's a good deal he wants to participate in, he moves forward with setting up a self-direct account, does a custodian to custodian transfer to get the money moved over. And we basically facilitate all of that once we receive his application and transfer form. And then from there, Denise provides Jacob or directly provides the account manager assigned to Jacob, the investment paperwork, the subscription documents. We make sure it's all listed in the name of the retirement account and tied through the retirement accounts tax ID number, not Jacob as an individual and not Jacob's social security number. Once we have that all filled out appropriately, we send Jacob a DocuSign to approve it all in principle. And then we execute the transaction and send the funds out. Moving forward for a rounded example, these numbers are rounded, but they are relatively reasonable for what you can expect for this type of deal. Uh, there's an 8% preferred distribution paid to all subscribers annually. In the fifth year, the project's refinanced and a lump sum payout is re returned to the investor. So over the course of five years, Jacob's IRA had generated $40,000 in the annual 
distributions, the annual preferred distributions, and a $30,000 lump sum when the final payout is done and the deal has gone full cycle. Um, that is the basis of a case study for a syndication investment. I use specifically the asset class of self-storage, but that can be applied to any of the other asset classes I briefly re referenced earlier in today's presentation. I don't see any questions right now, but again, I do implore the attendees to jot the questions down in the questions box if you have them. I'll uh, feel free to message them to Chris or speak out loud to Chris as we're going. Uh, but at this point, I'm gonna turn the tables over to Chris to continue with his portion of the presentation. Appreciate it, Corey. And I can see the questions as well. So I have them pulled up. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be on here today. We've had uh, a lot of investors that have worked with Advana your communication is great. So I um, want to thank, thank you for that. And hopefully we can provide some value back uh, to the listeners today. Um, again, my name is Chris Larson with Next Level Income. Um, I'm going to talk um, about a couple of the different asset classes that, that we have and that we work with. Um, those include multifamily, self-storage, story, Corey was just talking about, uh, mobile home parks. We have a, a, a debt fund as well, and we also have a vertically integrated car wash operating unit. Um, all these are offered to investors, although we're not going to be talking about any specific offerings today. Um, we're going to do some overviews about these different asset classes. Um, a little bit about me. I am very passionate about helping others achieve financial independence. Next Level Income was founded to provide education towards this end as well as investment opportunities. Some of the things that um, being an investor has allowed me, I bought my first property at 21 while I was still in college. I focused on single family rentals. Um, but this is a picture of me in the bottom left, wrapped in the Grand Canyon for three weeks at the World Series with my boys. Um, I live in Asheville, North Carolina, as Corey mentioned, just two miles from the Biltmore Estate, which is where we take a family picture every Mother's Day. And not only do we offer syndications, but I am an operator in these asset classes, including a car wash that, Corey, you may be familiar, or anybody else that's in Asheville may be familiar with um, down the road here. Um, that's uh, one of our, our local washes that we own. Um, you can go to the next slide here, Corey. Um, so why would you invest in private real estate? The reason that I decided to move largely from the stock market to alternatives and specifically real estate, you know, these private offerings are, are really three things. One, income. These provide income that can be predictable. And we'll talk about um, you know, one of the, uh, you know, some of the opportunities out there that tend to be higher on the income side, less on the appreciation and depreciation side, um, appreciation, but also depreciation. And I'm a firm believer in the to achieve financial independence, you need passive income. And this is why I've, I've chosen to focus on real estate. And if you look at the wealthiest families, the wealthiest individuals, not only today, but in history, they've built their wealth through businesses, and real estate primarily. And real estate is the number one asset class where the wealthiest families preserve their wealth. Next slide here. Um, so what are the options that are out there? Again, this is this is a, a small amount and these are, these are things that we offer through Next Level Income. Um, but when it comes to real estate, you know, we have a few different categories. There's our debt fund, which is basically income only, um, which is a private lending arm of our business. There is actual real estate that our investors participate in, including multifamily, which would be apartments. Um, we actually have a property under contract uh, in Houston currently that we're working on. It's a build to rent community. Um, just real quick, if you're not familiar with that, apartments, which most people are familiar with, is one, one segment. Build to rent are purpose built homes or sometimes townhomes that are rented out as well. And I would consider both of those multifamily. Um, and even the last category here, mobile home parks, I think you could also lump those into multifamily if you wanted. Uh, the mobile home parks tend to perform well during downturns and we focus on fairly heavier value add opportunities in that space as well as self-storage and hotels that all our investors get to participate on. Um, both on an income as well as an equity level. And then I'm going to talk about car washes today as well, but I think it's really important to point out that car washes are more of a business than real estate. So when you're looking as an investor at offerings that are out there, I think you need to be careful if you're looking at returns and saying, oh, these returns look better 
than returns in another asset class, you need to understand the different types of risks risk related. For example, I had an investor a couple of years ago say, hey, Chris, I only invest in deals that have a 25 or 30 percent return, like an IRR. And I was like, those sound like great deals. Send me like send me those deals. And he did. He sent me two deals. They were both development deals. So these were development deals, speculative deals that had no income, no income. So that's going to be different than a stabilized project that is, say, 95 percent occupied that, prevent, that pro, um, provides income from day one. And a business like a car wash is going to be different than a piece of, of class A real estate, if that makes sense. Keep going. So today, one of the challenges we face in the environment is that it's really hard to make a deal pencil out because prices are at record highs in terms of single family rentals, but also a lot of the uh, other real estate that's out there and interest rates are high. And that means that when prices are high and interest rates are high and um, loan to values are lower, you have lower cash flow on properties. So what's an investor to do if they're looking for predictable income, especially, excuse me, if you're, if you're looking at um, a retirement horizon? Our debt fund seeks to solve for that problem. And what our debt fund is, is a partnership with um, what's a company called Rehab Wallet. They originate loans and they originate hard money loans to fix and flippers. So if you haven't heard of a hard money loan, a hard money loan is going to be a loan that can be executed on a short-term basis. Typically within seven days, investors can get their money. And we usually lend for about six months. So our average loan is 183 days. So what we do is we provide the funds for these investors to go out and buy a house for say $300,000 put $50,000 into it and sell it for $500,000. And um, I don't know, Corey, if you've had anybody come in and talk about fix and flips before. Um, I don't want to go um, all the way down that rabbit hole, but it's it's something that's going on all the time, every day. And there's a big need for it right now because of the lack of, of housing that's out there. So an investor's capital is securitized, as it says here, with the hard real estate asset, so the actual property. And the nice thing is what we do with our debt fund is it is a liquid. Now we, we ask for 90 days to get your capital back, but we're typically returning money um, shorter than that. Um, that means you can park your capital in a fund like this. You can get a return and we pay monthly distributions. And then if an investor wants to put their money in something that's more predictable, I'm sorry, that's more long-term, um, maybe has a higher degree of unpredictability of when they're gonna get their capital back, but maybe there's an increased return on your investment, then it's available to do that as well. We've only had in four years, two defaults. Uh, we did about 450 loans last year, um, just, just as a uh, comparison there. And our partners have over 14 years in this space. They are loan originators, they are mortgage brokers, they are also fix and flip investors themselves. Um, so we have a long track record in this space. 90% of our current borrowers are repeat borrowers. Um, so we use our investor funds to pool capital for these. And the nice thing is when an investor invests in our fund, it's collateralized by every loan that's outstanding. So last month we did about 50 loans. So if you invested and your money was placed with an investor, as soon as it's placed, you're collateralized across all 50 of those loans. So how do we how do we find investors? So, um, or how do we? I'm sorry. How do we find borrowers? We find borrowers from uh, the relationships that we've we've built with them through my my partners over um, you know past decade and a half, and these are repeat borrowers. So they have businesses where they're repeatedly buying homes, fixing them up, and selling them. This is their business. And I know fix and flippers that they'll do 50 to 100 projects a year. So it's it's a legitimate business that is that um, they have crews and they're doing that we use third-party um, valuations we we have uh, um, third party come in and do um, an appraisal on the property and our typical loan to value is 60 to 65 percent last um, last my last check in here uh, it was 62 percent loan to value so we have a substantial amount of of equity in these properties which 
while during those we had two properties default, we were able to recover more than 100% of the capital that we had outstanding with that. And we use same software, same servicing, just like anybody out, out, out there is doing a, a regular mortgage. Um, this says six month loan commitment. We will go up to nine months. Our average um, loan on, on these properties currently is 183 days. Um, so we're seeking out about a six month um, loan period. And our borrowers are typically paying about 14% interest. So the sooner they can pay us back and move on to the next property, the more profit that they make. So we're all in the same boat here. Um, and we wanna make sure that you know we are keeping our borrowers happy, but we also wanna make sure that we're able to get that money back, turn it over. And if somebody um, is not paying in a reasonable amount of time, we will we'll work with them um, if we have a relationship with them. Um, but if they're not upholding their side of the bargain, then we're probably not gonna work with that borrower again. And Chris, before we move on to the next slide, there was a question that kind of relates to that final point and something you said on the last slide. Um, the question reads, yeah. you mentioned that the loans are six month periods, uh, but the money is held for 90 days. Can you please clarify? Yes. So uh, we're talking about kind of two sides of the business. So um, when we, when an investor invests in our fund, in our debt fund, we are pooling the capital, our debt fund, and then we're providing it to the borrowers that are borrowing for the fix and flip. So the average loan duration for the borrowers is 183 days. And for investors, if you invest as an investor, you say, hey, I'm going to invest. And then if you raise your hand and say, I would like my money back, we ask for 90 days to give you your money back. However, um, we've been returning it in, in a shorter period than that. Typically, um, for smaller amounts of money, $100,000 roundabout, um, we're usually able to return that amount of capital within about um, 25 to 30 days. Um, but we do ask for 90 days. For higher amounts, um, we actually have bonuses um, or, or higher interest rates that we pay. Um, so we pay, I think this is in the, maybe in the next slide. Um, we pay 8% paid out monthly for investments of $100,000 or more. Um, at $500,000 to a million dollars, we pay 9%, but we ask for a one-year lockup. And then at a million dollars or more, we'll pay 10%, um, again, with that one-year lockup. And then for amounts under $100,000, uh, we pay 6% until that amount um, is, is $100,000. And one of the things that's nice and what makes this uh, one of our most popular offerings specifically for investors with self-directed IRAs, investors can elect to accumulate funds um, and uh, have a cumul uh, cumulative distribution. So you can leave your money in the fund and accumulate. Um, also for investors in our other projects, they can have their distributions moved from those projects into the debt fund. So if you have, um, say an investment in, in an apartment um, or a self storage project, or even a car wash, and you say, well, wow, Chris, I, would, I have some money in the debt fund. I'd like to have my distributions go into the debt fund until I wanna take them out or put them in another project. You can do that, which again, is somebody that has a self-directed IRA, I know this can be a drag on the liquidity that you have. So that's one of the other things that we look to solve with this debt fund. Yeah, so this is a little bit of a summary here. Um, the best thing, again, um, I don't wanna go into you know, all the specifics of, of the offering itself today. Um, I know on the last slide, Corey, uh, we're gonna have a way for people to reach out if you wanna gain more information. So I'll, I'll share that here at the end, or you can just email me at chris at nextlevelincome.com. So let's move into, um, oh, so this is, yeah, I'm glad we left this slide in here. Um, so Rehab Wallet is the operating side of our business. You can see some of the footprint that we have here. Um, this is more of a heat map because this does, certainly does not have all of the loans um, that we have at any one time. Um, but uh, my partners are based in Columbia, South Carolina and Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I'm in Asheville, so you can see um, you can almost make a line right up to 26 corridor there. And that's kind of our, our big heat map there. Um, we have a lot of borrowers in Atlanta. We have them in Nashville, um, you know, some in the larger cities within, within North Carolina as well. These are all markets that we own properties in, um, for the most part, like these larger markets. And we, we know the value of these properties and we are not afraid 
to own one of the properties that we have one of these loans on. So um, this is the these are where the majority of our loans are in the southeast here with a nexus really around the South Carolina, North Carolina and Georgia markets. All right, so we're going to shift gears a little bit. Again, if you want to learn more about um, any of these, I'll have all of our contact information here at the end. But um, I looked into personally buying a car wash about, oh man, I started off saying seven years and that was a couple of years ago. Um, it was about nine years ago, back um, about 2015, um, 2014, 2015, um, with my uncle, we started looking into this space. I had some um, coaching clients that had car washes and I saw how profitable they were. And, you know, one of the things that really stood out to me was, was the high profit margins in, in car washes. And in America, we love our cars. We absolutely love our cars. I wish I could see some hands here, um, but I'll do a poll here about who, who actually washes themselves, washes the cars themselves in a moment. Um, but look, car ownership is at a 40 year high. Um, people say, yeah, Chris, but what about like Tesla and ride shares and all that? Well, if you hop into an Uber, you want a clean car. You know, when you go to, you know, test drive a car, um, you want a clean car at the, at the dealership. Um, people like to have a clean car, whether it's a newer car or an older car and you want to maintain it, people like to have a clean car. And it's one of these things that's kind of like an affordable luxury. Um, the car wash space has become very um, popular in the private equity space um, recently because the model is scalable and it has what's called MRR, monthly recurring revenue. And I'm gonna talk about some of the different models that are out there, but we focus on a membership-based model. So kind of like um, you know, Netflix or um, you know, any, any other type of subscription model where you have a monthly subscription, um, but you can also make purchases outside of that. And you know, I mentioned that private equity is entering the space. You know, the interesting thing is it's still highly fragmented. Only Mr. Wash is the, is the current publicly traded company that's out there in the space. 80, 85%, you know, 80 to 85% of the washes are owned by what you would call mom and pops that have four or less sites that are out there. And the interesting thing is that on an international basis, if you go to business school, they're going to say the market leader is going to have 5% or more of a market. Mr. Wash has three and a half percent. So there's really no defined market leader in this space. And it's going to take close to 15 years to fully build out the space. So we believe that there's about a five year window to get into this, to get into the car wash space. We've been in it for um, a couple of years now. Uh, we have our own operating company and we believe that we can build a brand. We can build out our locations and that's going to give us plenty of time to sell to a larger operator that wants to consolidate, sell to a private equity group that wants to own a nice cash flowing business with or without the operating arm of the business or potentially even do an IPO. Um, it's uh, about a $15 billion industry now. The Compound and annual growth rate is about four percent for the majority of this decade. And you know, if if you know, you guys can raise your hands there um, if you're out there. But I say, hey, who actually washes your car yourself? And I don't mean like go to a car wash. I mean like in your driveway, pull out a bucket, pull out soap, pull out the hose. Most of us are going and having someone else wash our car, whether it's a um, an in bay automatic, an express tunnel car wash. Um, or, you know, some of us use, um, uh, people that like detail their car. I have a guy, he comes once a quarter and he actually comes to my house. Great guy, Nate. And he washes both our cars for us once a quarter. Um, and then I use our, our car washes on, on a weekly basis to do that. So let's go ahead. I know there's some repeat here on this on the market. So what types of car washes are out there? So again, I, I'd love, you can raise your hand, um, and kind of play along with me at home, even though I can't see you. But you know, we that picture of me on the earlier slide was in front of our in-bay automatic wash that we have. And I like to call these like a robo wash. You pull your car in, you park your car, and the robot goes around your car and washes it. So um, some of you may be familiar with that. I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna slide to the right side of the slide. This is a self-service car wash. And when I was in college, um, I started racing bicycles when I was 14. So I've been I've been riding and, and racing bicycles competitively for um, a few decades now. And 
what I did in college, after I go to r- ride mountain bikes, I'd come and I'd go to one of these self-serve washes. I'd wash my bike off. Um, and it's, they're, they're self-serve. You probably put quarters in them. Um, you know, you, you do it yourself. You go through the, the water and the soap and those sorts of things. But the most popular in terms of growth these days is what's called the express tunnel car wash here in the middle. So our, our model does focus on the express tunnel. And this is basically a giant conveyor belt. You pull in and it pulls your car through the wash. And this model, we like it for a few different reasons. There, there's a fairly high, high barrier to entry. If you're going to buy or build one of these, you're looking at somewhere around a $5 million investment. $3 million on the low end, $10 million on the high end. So you have to buy the site, you have to build the building, you have to buy all the equipment. So, you know, when we build these ourselves, um, you're looking at around a $5 million investment. Um, we aren't afraid to build ourselves, but we've bought the majority of our 31 locations and rebranded them. And what we do is we come in, we rebrand with our Hurricane Express Wash brand. We upgrade the tunnels if needed. So if it's a brand new wash, maybe we don't need to do this, but um, we love to have really awesome, nice new vacuums, dryers. Um, we have a national chemical contract with a company called Turtle Wax, which you guys may have heard of. Um, we lower the average chemical cost per car from $1.50 to under a dollar when we take over because of our national contracts that we have. Um, we also do things like we work with the local municipalities, town, city to say, hey, we are using water, but we're reclaiming the water, so we're not dumping it back into the sewer. So we would like a, a break on in terms of cost with that. Um, one of the other things that we're doing, which uh, in our opinion is really revolutionizing the market, is we have a proprietary app and CRM. Because the industry is highly fragmented, because you have mostly these smaller operators, you don't have a ton of technology that's available out there. And one of the things we noticed is that if you build on a Thursday instead of a Saturday for a membership, you lost more of your your credit cards. So you had these credit card cards declined, or you had um, a charge declined if you had a, a debit card. And the reason is people typically get paid on a Friday. And if you're billing somebody on a Thursday, you're going to have more people with less money in their bank accounts than if you than if you bill them on a Saturday. So simple things like that and really understanding some of the dynamics that are at play in the market. We also, if you join one of our Hurricane Express wash sites with a membership, we bill you weekly. So instead of say $30 a month, maybe you have a five to $10 charge per week. So it's a little bit more digestible um, for people. Also, um, for, for those of you out there that, that are uh, thinking like, like we do, what's nice is in, you bill 52 times a year instead of say 12 times a year. So you get a couple more billing weeks in. Um, so you get a little bit higher profit when it comes to that. Um, but you also have a smaller dollar dollar figure for pe- for your customers. Um, in terms of value, one of the things that we do is we have a single membership per, per household and you can add as many cars as you want. Now, some of you may be thinking, Chris, that's silly. But the thing is, you're more likely to get members when you offer that. And then the other thing that we know, again, this is thinking forward in terms of the technology and in terms of analytics and the, and the value of data is that because of our multifamily underwriting background, we understand how to evaluate um, MSAs, so um, local markets from a one mile, three mile, five mile radius. And what we found is instead of just focusing on local traffic count for a wash location, if we focus on the local demographic and specifically the socioeconomics and the um, the household income in that area, we can more reliably predict whether a customer is going to purchase a membership. And then when they do, you will know that I live in Asheville, North Carolina, and I have an Acura MDX because it's in the app. And my wife has, now you might not know it's hers, but you know, we also have a BMW X5. That's very valuable information for companies that are looking for partnerships when it comes to that. And then in terms of increasing revenue, We've tried all kinds of different stuff, all kinds of different technologies and ad campaigns. And after about a year, we, we tried something simple. And for somebody that's got um, more than 20 years um, in, in, this, in sales and in different types of sales, 
it's a little embarrassing to say that we figured out that the most effective way to add revenue is to add a sales associate. So if you have somebody standing there and says, hey, Corey, would you like to buy a membership today? That is the most successful and meet the most reliable way to increase revenue. And we found that um, when we implemented this, we were able to increase revenue 100 to 125%, so more than double for each location. And what we were able to do after implementing this, we've, we were able to actually not increase only NOI, but also top line revenue into Q4 of last year. And if you look at the trends in the industry, typically Q4 is the weakest quarter because you have bad weather, you have the holidays, you have shorter days, people aren't washing their car. Despite all of those headwinds, despite what was going on in the rest of the industry, we increased our top line revenue and significantly increased our profit. Our target exit is three to five years. We are buying these locations for uh, you business owners out there, um, you business people out there around an 8x multiple of EBITDA. And with over 30 locations being one of the top operators in the country in the top 35, our goal is to be in the top 20 by the end of this year. We can sell today with a portfolio that size around a 12x multiple of EBITDA, which is how we underwrite our, our exit multiple. But we have seen, and you can go look this up. There's an article in the Wall Street Journal here about a year ago. You know, we're seeing exits 18, 20, 22x of EBITDA for larger portfolios, 50, 100, 150 locations. So our goal is to get to um, 100 to 150 locations before we sell to give us those higher exit multiples and higher returns for our investors. And that will give us the option with our operating group to sell to a larger operator, to sell to a private equity group, or even to do an IPO. So as I mentioned, we have 31 locations. You can look up uh, hurricanewash.com. Um, look up Hurricane Wash, hurricanewash.com. And uh, you can check out where our locations are. Um, let, me, let me see here if I can put this in the, uh, in the notes, but I think it's pretty easy to remember, hurricanewash.com. You can click on where our locations are. Um, this is just kind of a sample of, of what we charge and uh, a map of where some of our locations are. Um, again, we, we target... Um, the Southeast in general, North Carolina, South Carolina. We have locations in Florida, um, Tennessee, as well as Huntsville, Alabama. Um, also in the Virginia Beach, Norfolk area, where my in-laws live, and also um, as far north as uh, Baltimore area as well. And this is showing, um, I think I mentioned, you know, we were seeing 100, 125% growth. Um, this was a, a snapshot a little bit before that. You know, just from that point where we introduced sales associates and the and the growth that we saw was was you know really almost exponential after we did that. So um, top line revenue, efficient operations, um, and our goal is to really be the Chick Fil A of the car wash market. Can you get a better wash by hiring somebody to detail your car for a hundred dollars? Absolutely, but you're going to get a better value going to a Hurricane Express wash location. You're going to be treated nicely. You're going to be treated with respect. Our employees are well-dressed. You're going to get um, a great value, just like when I take my boys to Chick-fil-A and I pay five bucks for a sandwich, I'm going to get a better value. I'm going to have a great experience. I could definitely get a better sandwich, Corey, by going to um, White Labs and getting you know their fried chicken sandwich with pimento, but it's going to cost me 15 bucks, plus I'm going to buy a drink, plus I'm going to pay a tip. Um, yeah, it's a better sandwich, but on a day-to-day -day basis, Hurricane Express Wash is going to give you the Chick-fil-A experience in the car wash space. Um, we just closed out a washering, uh, um, a car, sorry, a car wash offering, um, which is called uh, Pick Car Wash Seven. Um, so what we've been doing for investors is we offer basically small portfolios of car washes. So you're going to get, you know, two, three, um, five car washes per offering that you can invest in. So you're going to be, uh, as an investor with us, you're going to be invested in those specific car washes, but you're going to get the value that the brand brings to all of these washes. So it's gonna give you that enhanced value. Um, if you wanna learn more, if you wanna see one of our past offerings, um, I think Corey, we have a, um, a QR code here in the next couple of slides that investors can take a look at and, and learn about how to reach out to us to learn more. Yeah, I believe there definitely is the QR code there. Just reminding the audience, this is a closed deal. So we're just showing it for example, correct. sake and purpose. That is correct. If so if you want to see that offering, um, 
you you're not able to invest in that specific offering, but it will give you an idea and a flavor um, of what we do. So yeah, in, um, congruent with what we were talking about at the beginning. Um, not sharing any specifics, but if you want to learn more, if you have any questions that I didn't cover, I'm happy to um, answer questions for the next five to 10 minutes, but you can reach out to me, um, Chris at nextlevelincome.com. Check us out at nextlevelincome.com. And if you scan that QR code, you should also be able to, uh, to get a free copy of our book, which is also available at the website, nextlevelincome.com. Um, if you want to learn more about our offerings, please click on the invest link. You can schedule a call with our team. Um, we work mostly with accredited investors, um, which uh, um, I'm happy to go through that definition, Corey. But um, we also have offerings um, from time to time, which are open to sophisticated investors if you're not accredited as well. Yeah, and uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't remind the audience as well about the podcast, the Next Level Income podcast that Chris hosts. You can check that out for his own brand of educational content and information with uh, guest speakers and, and different conversations that are intriguing and, and um, interesting for, I'm sure, our audience. We, we have a lot of carryover in what we do, uh, respectively, at Advanta IRA and what you do at Next Level Income. So just want to remind everyone to check that out if they have interest. Corey, I appreciate you saying that. And you know, our big passion is is really education. How can we help you get closer to your your goal? Um, hopefully, you know, becoming financially independent, giving you more freedom to do what you want in life. And that's one of the reasons um, I love working with you, Corey, and helping helping spread that um, the education to as many people as possible. Um, if of there's course. any questions, I'm happy to go through those now. Yeah, I see one question uh, for me here at the bottom, and then I'll. I'll work my way back up to the questions that relate to your presentation. Someone just asked if I'm over age 59 and a half, are there any fees for taking regular distributions from an IRA? No. Uh, once you reach uh, retirement age, uh, you are not hit with the 10% early distribution or early withdrawal penalty. Uh, so for that individual, you can start drawing out of your account without any uh, explicit fees or, or deductions from the IRS uh, when you're drawing from your retirement dollars. A few questions that came on earlier, I believe you answered um, one of them about the six month period versus the 90 day period being from the investor investment provider side. Someone asked, you mentioned borrowers paying an example 14%. Is that APR or for the loan term an example six months? Uh, yeah, so they're going to pay monthly, but, um, yeah, it's, it's typically, again, it, it varies. It depends on the, the quality and the history with the borrower. So it's typically for about 14% APR. Um, so, you know, we're paying investors, uh, eight up to well, six, typically eight up to 10%. Um, that additional margin is there to give us a buffer for defaults. Um, and that's how, that's how we profit from, from that side of the business as well. Next question. Just, just, similar. To be, just one quick clarification. Sure. Um, we pay investors before we pay operations. So investors get paid first in that um, in that in that uh, line. Perfect. Um, one question in the similar vein of that. If it is eight percent annually, if my capital is invested for three months on my returns, eight divided by twelve times three. That's the way the questions worded there. Um yes. Yeah, so uh, the, the short answer, the short answer is le yes. Um, the longer answer is uh, at 8%, $100,000 or more investment, 8%, it's going to be 0.67% per month. And it, it technically would compound at that rate um, if you if you leave the capital in or you would just get 0.67%. So however many months you're in, it'd be, it'd be that, it'd be yes, 8% divided by 12 times the number of months that you are in it. If you got distributions, if you left them in, it would be compounded. Perfect. Um, I had someone ask for the contact information, which is on the screen right now. So please feel free to pull that. Um, someone asked, uh, where can we watch the recording? Because they didn't um, get the link until a little bit after we got started. Uh, the recording will be emailed to everyone that registered for today's webinar. And the recording will also be hosted live on Advanta IRA's YouTube page within roughly one business day. Within about 24 hours, you can find the recording of today's presentation on Advanta IRA's YouTube. Um, Someone asked me to make a direct introduction to you via email, Chris. I'll handle that later today. Can we look at the return and invest minimum slide for debt fund again? 
I do ask that person to just go to the handout section and uh, download the handout of today's presentation via PDF or reach out to either Chris or myself via email and we can share that with you directly. Um, someone asked when the next car wash fund will be open and what's the typical minimum investment just for compliance purposes on my end I do ask that person to reach out to Chris directly um, just not able to necessarily share that exact detail on this educational webinar for advantage compliance side of things I apologize um, someone asked early on and I did want to get your feedback on this Chris why should anyone invest into these types of assets with self-directed funds versus investing directly basically out of their savings account? Uh, I know you've mentioned you have your own self-direct account. You deal with a lot of self-directed investors uh, for your deals. Uh, how would you kind of weigh um, you know, the different sides of, of investing for a general person that has money in savings and also has money in a retirement account to utilize? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um... I don't think there's there's a simple answer to that, but you know when I when I look at that, I say okay, um, does the investment have tax advantages? So one of the nice things about real estate is that you typically have depreciation. So um, typically some, most, or or all of your income can be shielded from taxes um, or offset. Um, your taxes are offset by the. They, let me rephrase that. Your income is offset by depreciation. So you may end up not having to pay tax on that income. Um, so if you have two buckets of money um, and one is going to go, say, into um, you know, uh, something like a, a pure income play like the debt fund, where it's not going to be offset by depreciation, that may be a good fit for something like a self-directed IRA, where it can go into that and, and be shielded from taxes. Whereas you know, if you have you know, another bucket of money that's cash, and you say, well, I'm going to invest in a car wash. Maybe, maybe the cash would be better put to use in the car wash because you're going to have um, depreciation to offset that. So again, um, you have to make that decision um, on your own. But that's how I that's how I an, I analyze that and, and look at that. Perfect. And the last two questions before we wrap up today's webinar. Um, Wonderful hearing your knowledge and insight in the car wash industry. One question, how do we say that it is recession, recession resistant business? Yes, now I'll, temp, I'll temper my, my answer a little bit and say, um, you know, we can't go back a hundred years and, and look at all the recessions in, in a hundred year period. Um, but kind of like we saw during 2020 in the great recession, there are things that people continue to spend money on when there is a recession and i would call these things and you could you know look at it like affordable luxuries so you know you you still will buy alcohol you still will watch netflix you still will wash your car and do things like that um, there are things that fall into those categories where people if you think of all those things people still want to feel good when the economy is not doing well and they'll spend a, uh, an amount of money to get that feeling. And if you look at the top five reasons why people go to an express tunnel car wash, quality is number four out of five. Number one is basically it makes me feel good. And if you think about it, if you have a car and your car is clean, it's kind of like, you know, if, if I wear, if I put a suit on, I'm going to feel more confident. I, if I look good, if I have a haircut, a recent haircut, you know, there's the old adage, go get your shoes shined. You know, for those of you that used to shine your shoes like I did before an interview, you feel more confident. That's what people like. You know, it's also kind of fun. My kids love going through the wash because the lights and the brushes and all that stuff, you know, you, you pull pull open the, uh, not open the, the sunroof, but open the, the cover so you can see everything. Um, so, you know, values up there, experience is up there. Um, when it comes to that, but um, the quality of the wash is actually number four. So that's that for all those reasons that why that's one of the things I can I can say um, this is this is recession resistant, if not recession proof. Perfect. And the final question we'll leave the audience on. Someone asked you to repeat what you said about non-accredited investors. If you just from a you know three thousand foot uh, glance want to differentiate accreditation and non-accreditation and, and where you know these types of deals stand with those different buckets. Sure. So you can look up the definition of accredited, but typically it's um, is an individual $200,000 or more of income in, in prior years, as well as expectation that in the future, $300,000 for a couple and or a net worth of $1 million, not including your primary residence. 
all of our offerings are open and are open to accredited investors. Um, not all are open to non-accredited investors, but we do um, from time to time. Usually our, our mobile home park offerings are open to non-accredited investors. If you are close to that mark or you have um, a level of sophistication that allows you to understand uh, the risks and the benefits in these types of investments. Hopefully that, I know that wasn't super long. I know we're wrapping up our time here. So hopefully that was concise. Yep. No, that was perfect. I think that was spot on. Uh, also referencing the sophisticated investor class for people to just be knowledge uh, or, or be able to research themselves. Just to, to end that point, when you're talking about making this type of investment from a retirement account, your ability to complete an accredited investor questionnaire carries through to your retirement account's ability to make that type of investment as either an accredited or not accredited investor. So just wanted to add that piece. And for one last time, Ty, the great presentation that Chris has brought to the table back to self-directed retirement account investing. I thank everyone for participating with us today, for sitting and uh, you know learning a little bit about this type of asset class and about these types of investments. And uh, I really, really want to thank Chris for joining us and bringing his expertise to the table to share with you guys. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. And if either of us can help you any further, please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you, everybody, and have a great one.